Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of ShumaCast. I am Noel, being joined, as always, by Angie. Hello, everyone. And we are being joined by a very special guest today. Everyone, please welcome Kat. Hello. Welcome. Kat, do you want to just tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, what you do? Yeah, so I am a professional cook. I've been cooking for about nine years, and for about four of that, I've been doing a lot of seasonal work, both in Alaska and McMurdo Station, Antarctica. So awesome! I bounce around a little bit. It's nice following your newsletters. You are quite the world traveler. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, I was feeling lately like, oh, I haven't done enough this year. And I'd been to Pride in Sydney and three national parks. So it's fine. It's fine. (laughs) I've done enough. You're allowed to just find a place to chill for a while. Yes, exactly. I was like beating myself up because I couldn't find time to visit my friends in Alaska. Mm. No, no, it's fine. They're not closing Alaska. (laughs) Though you are about to go back to Antarctica, right? Yes, I'll be heading out for that in about 10 days. Mm. I'm still waiting to get my official plane ticket and it's nerve wracking. Mm. I can imagine the process for that might be complicated. A little bit. There's a whole like third party agency that mm. issues my plane tickets. So yeah, sometimes I don't find out about them till the week before and they always immediately go to my spam folder. So I've got to <laughs> keep looking at the horror that is my spam folder and see if between all the bus deep singles that want to talk to me <laughs> is an actual official legit plane ticket. <laughs> Nice. Well, we have you here because with your cooking background, we wanted you on for this show, which is such a thorough and richly detailed examination of the food service industry. Really the predecessor to Kitchen Confidential. Mm, Absolutely. For our listeners, we had just taken our break at the end of the 80s, and we were going to start the 90s with Flatliners, but I found something. (laughs) How did you find this? Well, the thing is, when we did our Lost Boys episode, we recorded that extra segment where it's like, oh, hey, by the way, here's a bunch of music videos that Joel was involved in that I didn't know about and we forgot to cover. So I just did a deep (laughs) dig of the internet to try to find, were there any other music videos that I've missed? I found a few, but they're ones Mm -hmm. that we'll be getting to. And I found on some just rare buried in the internet profile of Joel Schumacher, (laughs) it mentioned, yes, he also directed a 1983 sitcom pilot called Now We're Cooking. It's not entirely correct. He did not direct it. He wrote and executive produced it. But yes, this is a 1983 sitcom pilot. Now We're (laughs) Cooking. That's cooking I-N apostrophe. Mm-hmm. Important to know. <laughs> when I found that this existed, I was like, oh, hey, I wonder if I can maybe find an article on it. I found the entire episode on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, Angie, we're covering this. <laughs> I don't know how it got on YouTube because it apparently never aired. It looks like it's a master tape. It looks like it's some kind of a presentation tape because it has the company logos at the beginning and end. Well, and I know it had like some scanning issues too, or like, yeah. or whatever you call it. So it was like, yeah, who knows where they found this? <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering what the story is behind who dug this up and put it up on YouTube. But yeah, so we're covering, now we're cooking. But before we get into that, Kat, I just want to ask, is Joel Schumacher someone that you had ever previously been familiar with and had ever seen many of his movies? I mean, you sent me the IMDb, and so it turns out there is a lot of his that I've seen Mm. and not realized. I still am a very, very big comic person for like a big part of the early 2000s, so I've seen every Batman movie, Mm -hmm. including Mm -hmm. that infamous era. Yeah, I've definitely seen like Phone Booth. I don't know if I've ever seen The Lost Boys, honestly. (laughs) Well, this show was my first time, so it's well worth tracking. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely a recommend. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how he has a career where it's like there's Batman and then you kind of have to get people to dig to realize that, oh, yeah, I've seen these other things, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm presuming none of you had ever seen Now We're Cooking before. 
No. No. I can't really find much history on it. Joel's never mentioned it in interviews. I wasn't able to find any other interviews. By the way, Now We're Cooking doesn't even have an IMDb page. Right, right. Wow. I will fix that. I've made IMDb pages before. (laughs) I will give it one. (laughs) It is shocking that not only is there this obscure thing, but that we found it. Mm -hmm. Bless you, internet. (laughs) Yeah. So the only real production issue I have on it is it was written and executive produced by Joel Schumacher. The episode was directed and produced by Noam Pitlick, who was a prolific sitcom director in the 80s and 90s, you know, like Step by Step, Golden Girls. Pretty much every sitcom you grew up with, he probably Mm -hmm. did a chunk of episodes for. Gotcha. And this is one of only four producing credits he has. And two of the others were also for pilots, which were never picked up. One of which was a nine to five TV series. That'd be cool. Hmm. Okay. And the other producer is Leonard Rips, who was a prolific sitcom writer who was also one of the writers of the Star Wars holiday special. Oh, gosh. Ooh. He rips a new one. (laughs) And he also co-wrote Tim Burton's original short film version of Frankenweenie. Oh, okay. And that's it. That's all I got. (laughs) I know nothing. I I have, like, some other crew members who worked on this film that are interested, but we'll save them for later. Right. Anyone got anything before I just jump into the synopsis? No, let's go. Yeah. Now We're Cooking is about a trio of ex-cons on parole who all work at an L.A. diner run by Marge. Wendell Cookie Porter is a former bookie who still consults on racing bets from time to time. Owen Hudson has a bit of a temper, which once led him to run over a cop's motorcycle five times. Tony Trizola is a bigamist who can't help but fall for every woman in sight. And things get complicated when one of Tony's old flames, Roxanne, shows up looking for help after witnessing a mob hit. The timing is bad for this because they've just met their new parole officer, Janine Rogers, who reminds them that it's illegal for ex-cons to associate with one another while on parole, and Detective Ernie starts breathing down their necks as he's on Roxanne's trail. The men manage to sneak Roxanne out of the diner, but she steals their car, gets in a high-speed chase with Ernie, and crashes it right through the front window of the diner. When Roxanne shows up, the three guys all argue about whether or not to turn her over, with Trizola ultimately convincing them she's part of his people, he's part of their people, they all protect one another, but he also then convinces Roxanne to turn herself in. The three guys figure they're going to get fired, but Marge tells them insurance will cover the repairs, plus who's going to work this job for so cheap. Now we're cooking. (laughs) Angie, do you recommend Now We're Cooking? If you're a fan of Car Wash, DC Cab, Dixie Night at the Bar and Grill, it's definitely worth looking this up because there's a lot of similarities there in these characters that Joel is writing and the way he brings them to life. If you didn't necessarily care about those movies, I would say, eh, it's okay. (laughs) It's an early 80s sitcom. I'm not entirely surprised it didn't get picked up. Kat, do you recommend it? On its own? Probably not, but I think if it had been picked up, you know, don't have the strongest pilot or even first season, there's interesting places it could have gone. I definitely would have liked to see more of Cleavon Little out in Mm -hmm. the world. Yeah, as it is, no, not a recommend. (laughs) Yeah, I'm kind of like that too. It's kind of a clumsy pilot. It's a little dull. Some of the jokes are really bad, Mm -hmm. but it's an interesting oddity. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like, as Angie mentioned, in relation to like Car Wash and DC Cab, it's fascinating seeing them try to take that style and transfer it to the TV sitcom. Right. Doesn't quite work, but it's also not terrible. It's only 20 minutes of your time. (laughs) Yeah. And it's on YouTube. It's free. It's on YouTube. It's free. I did not expect them to actually crash a car through the set, which was quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It's not bad. I think it's mostly just the first half is dull. Once you get past the first half, it actually does pick up a bit. It actually becomes kind of fun and and lively and takes some nice turns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm kind of on the, I don't recommend it. I don't not recommend it, but it's interesting. Right. Particularly, I've got friends who are kind of interested in unaired pilots. One of my friends has a whole playlist I can see for those people, this is definitely a culturally interesting gem. Yeah. To kind of get into the setup, the setup is interesting, where three cons on parole trying to get past that as they set up new lives at this diner. And I kind of love that they even take a jab at, what do you expect us to do, work at a car wash? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
the main thing is just what was great about Car Wash was still there was that kind of weight to it Mm -hmm. that DC Cab and this one don't really have. It's mostly just liveliness and jokes. Yeah, it's like the whole thing of which they said the pilot around is, oh, they're not supposed to work together. And yet they just kind of hand wave the whole like, yeah, y'all can work together. It's fine. It's like, shouldn't that be more of a dynamic of how are they going to get away with that all the time or Mm -hmm. something, you know, and it's not really there. Uh, They're just like, I'll talk to my manager about it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did kind of like that backstory of the parole officer who took over because their previous parole officer, there was that great line, you're going to trust the one man who got fired from public service. (laughs) Right. I don't know at the time if you could have done a show that would juggle the tones of get into some of the serious aspects of what it's like to be living as an ex-con and Mm -hmm. how there's so many walls that are thrown up around you there while also being funny. Right. Yeah, I did notice they clearly stated what everyone's crime was in the Mm -hmm. first episode, Mm -hmm. got that established quickly, and that they're all fairly harmless crimes, or at least funny, not dark or violent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not to keep comparing it to Car Wash, but Car Wash had the character of the ex-con who's on parole, who's worried about his future and worried about losing it all. And he was on parole for a person getting killed in a violent armed robbery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much lighter than that. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you had that kind of brooding aspect to him where it's like he's ashamed of having done something that awful and is trying to move on from it. Yeah. Yeah. And in this one, yeah, you got the bigamist who's constantly hitting on every woman in sight. Mm -hmm. We know what Cleavon Little's character was arrested for. He got pulled over by a cop and then ran over the cop's motorcycle five times. But I can't tell if that ties into this personality of he kind of is the first one. I don't know if he's supposed to like have a temper and he's always the first one to anger, but they never really quite get that personality down for him. Right. He's not so much angry as just a smart ass. Yeah. Really. A lot of gently menacing sass. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and being a black man, they could have played it into he was wrongfully pulled it over and got pissed about it. But yeah, they don't really touch on that. Yeah, I don't know if 1983 sitcoms would have gone there. <laughs> probably not. Yeah. Joel probably would have. But yeah. <laughs> I think the closest they get to even making reference to him being black is when he jokes to the bigamist that he's a credit to his race. Mm. Yeah. And then the other guy, Cookie the Cook, who used to be Cookie the Bookie, mm-hmm. is again the kind of smart ass con man who is still giving people tips on races, even though he's not booking them anymore. Right. They are convicted of very light crimes that you can make jokes about. Which makes sense, really, for mm-hmm. a sitcom like this. You wouldn't want a murderer here. <laughs> Yeah. You could actually almost restage this as a drama that has humor in it instead of doing it as a sitcom. It's such a great premise to explore. Mm-hmm. It just feels a little deflating that they just did it like this. <laughs> just a little workplace sitcom. Funsies. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Lyman Ward as Cookie, the former mm-hmm. bookie. Cat, what do you think of Cookie? I mean, he's just playing the sitcom lead of that era, doing it pretty well. But that hairstyle, <laughs> I feel like it's important <laughs> if you're going to be running a sitcom at the time, if you're going to be a Charles in charge or a Tony Danza type. <laughs> and it's worth mentioning, only a few years later, he was Ferris Bueller's dad. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yep. Oh. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Not a lot happening there, but kind of benevolent. He played a lot of dads. He's kind of the straight man of the group, I guess, in a way. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, at least he's not as goofy as... Like, Raleigh's always, like, wisecracking and making jokes, and then Tony's the goofball, so he kind of ends up being the sort of almost father figure by default. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come on, guys. Let's calm down so we don't go back to prison. Mm -hmm. I think he's a fun character on the page. I just don't think Lyman Ward has much charisma. No. I think he's a little too bland of an actor for that role. You needed someone who was a little slicker, a little more of a con man type. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I still like the way that he and... What was the name of Cleavon Lil's character? Because I have Owen Hudson. Raleigh? Raleigh? Yeah, I think that was his nickname. Okay, because I know Owen Hudson was what the parole officer called him when she was listing off their names, but okay, Raleigh. Mm. I like the way those two play off each other. Mm -hmm. They got kind of a Kirk McCoy thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. And again, yeah, Cleavon Little, it's always nice seeing him. He was always such a sharp performer who should have gone on bigger and better things, but (laughs) yeah, it's nice seeing him here. It's kind of a shame that no one saw him here. (laughs) Right, right. He's definitely, I think, the strongest character in the Mm -hmm. whole thing. Definitely. And then, Kat, what'd you think about Tony? As a character, uh, 
he's that Italian lover stereotype. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. pretty much his whole deal. He just loves ladies too much. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Was it the Godfather's fault that these like Italian meatheads were so common in like the late 70s and early 80s, I guess? Like you've seen this character before on other shows. Speaking of the character, we'll get to her in a minute, but the actress who plays Roxanne was on the entirety of The Sopranos. So. Okay. <laughs> but no, he's one of those characters who it's like, it's such a one note joke. I mean, what I like is mm-hmm. Raleigh and Cookie, they have interesting layers to their characters. You know, they're yeah. not trustworthy and yet you still want to trust them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's just a meathead who sleeps with everyone <laughs> Yeah, I guess he's supposed to be the comic relief, but it kind of falls flat most of the time. And that's like, it's kind of interesting how they basically open up with a story that involves him, but I don't know how that would work with the series carrying forward. Mm -hmm. He's just kind of got the one note. Yeah. Also, can you go to jail for bigamy? It seems extreme, doesn't it? It seems like they would just make you pair down to a wife. Right. Fine you, perhaps? Yeah. It used to be more of a thing. It's not as common anymore, depending on the state. But yeah, you could usually get a few years. Hmm. Okay. Especially if it's more than two. (laughs) Well, if you're doing the whole cult thing, then yeah, that deserves jail time. But if you're just lying to two women, that's a little different. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just... Jail time? Eh. I just wanted to be like, if the series continued, every now and then a woman would show up and it's like, oh, she's my (laughs) ex-wife. And it just keeps happening. and It's a different woman every time. Mm -hmm. If this had run like five years, we could have had like 18 wives by then. (laughs) That's like the only real further exploration Mm -hmm. I can get out of that character. Right. I don't really see him going anywhere else. No, because he's not going to get smarter. Right. (laughs) Angie, any thoughts on Carol Cook as Marge, the owner of the diner? Obviously, they were going to be building on that whole thing of her husband's memory, Mm because I know she mentions him multiple times. She's a motherly figure, I guess. There's not a whole lot to her. You don't really get enough in the story to know why she's so willing to put herself on the line for these guys, other than, yeah, okay, they're cheap to hire. But no, she does a good job. Yeah. She's a good character in that context of the past. And they'll be like, oh, look at you. You're nice mom. And as a human being living in 2018, you can't help but wonder about someone exploiting ex-convicts that easily. Yeah. Mm. Like, yeah, I don't have to pay you guys very much because you went to prison for nonviolent crimes. Ugh. Yeah, and that they're contrasting that with her shrugging off the damage to the restaurant with, ah, insurance will cover it. Yeah. How much did her husband leave her? I don't know. And again, it's an interesting premise for a show of what if this became like a rotating cast? Like as people get off a of parole and they're able to go off and get new jobs, you have new people coming in, new ex-cons. It would be interesting to kind of have like that seasonal rotating cast. Mm-hmm. But again, yeah, it's kind of raising that question of is she doing this out of altruistic means to actually help these people who are down on their luck? Or is she doing it because they're cheap labor? <laughs> right. Also, she's been running this restaurant for 25 years, but she mm-hmm. lost three employees at once because those guys started the job at the same time like (laughs) as someone who's been in the business that's very suspicious (laughs) well they violated their parole Uh, (laughs) they made a bunch of jokes (laughs) there's a cyclical nature to this story gotta stop hiring them all at once (laughs) (laughs) i think the other big character in this one cat what did you think of joe montagna as detective ernie He's definitely got like that whole 70s, 80s detective thing going. I like that they kind of name check Beretta and yeah. I was kind of easily swayed by wanting to be that cool TV cop. <laughs> but also a guy who pulls a gun on three people to make them open a door is yeah. disquieting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's playing the jerk, right? That's what he's yeah. supposed to be. So that's what he does. Well, but I just really like saying Joe Montana in anything. I like oh, him yeah. a lot. So that was just kind of fun. Like, oh, look who it is. But yeah, he's once again, it, this is a character that you saw pretty commonly around this time period. I kind of like that he has a bit of a love-hate relationship with the guys. He's mm-hmm. definitely coming down hard on them. He's definitely breathing down their necks. He definitely gave him a hard time. But there's also times where, you know, they're able to just like walk up, clap him on the shoulder, chat with them, say like, hey, can we sort this out? You know, it's interesting how he's a jerk, but he's not so locked into that that he's unwilling to listen. Mm -hmm. Had the series gone on, I could definitely see them having like a slightly 
heartwarming storyline of him being like, you guys are my only real friends. <laughs> yeah. And that's when they commit a crime <laughs> that, he <needs> to, <laughs> that he needs to bust them for. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sick. I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Montana, always one of my favorite actors. It, it is fun seeing him done up with, you know, the slick leather jacket and the beard and the flowing hair. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that he also has the worst jokes. Yeah. Like, I think it's from him that we get the, how many ex-cons does it take to screw in a light bulb? Yeah. Though I did really think it was funny that the car comes crashing through and then he runs in and he goes, that's the last high speed chase I do on foot or something like that. That was pretty <laughs> funny. <laughs> I've got to give their staging credit. It's a little bit bland for the first half of the episode, but yeah, mm -hmm. when Roxanne steals the car, there's this whole off screen car chase where the guys are just watching it out the window. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the car comes right up through the window into the set. Yeah. The main thing about it is it just comes out of nowhere because it has been so like mellow and just these people talking and everything. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's like, <laughs> I guess that's where you were saving all your budget for. All right. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, well, it's your pilot. You got to make sure you, you get some kind of punch in. Right. Uh, the first thing is, I think people would have changed the channel before then. But still, yeah, what was funny was when I started watching this show, I'm like, what would it have been like had you actually just turned Car Wash into a sitcom? But then I realized, yeah, but then you have the budgets of, you mm -hmm. know, all the suds and the water and the cars coming in and out. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, they just want something simple, something cheap. Don't really do anything too expensive. Mm -hmm. Then a car comes flying. Through the <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So that was a fun surprise. And then they keep the restaurant open for the rest right? of the day. Yeah. And people want to come in just to check it out. I love the whole crowd of people that comes in. And then I love the whole bit where Detective Ernie is like, everyone's spread eagle on the floor. And then all the customers are like, wait, us? Yeah, and then the poor old lady. And then he says, not you, to the little lady with walker. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And then Angie, any thoughts about Lynn Moody as Janine Rogers, the new parole officer? She was okay. She didn't really have much of a thing. I could kind of tell where if it had gone on longer, I could see them possibly trying to start a little flirtation between her and Raleigh. Mm. But she didn't really have a whole lot to do. She wasn't really giving them that much of a hard time. It was like she presented a problem, but then it wasn't really a problem. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of anticlimactic. Yeah, kind of same. I could definitely see they were trying for some chemistry there. Like Raleigh flirts with her as soon as she comes in. Yeah, there's not a lot of conflict. She's just like, oh, I guess I'll talk to my supervisor. <laughs> it's fine now. Yep. <laughs> it's like, I understand her presence on the show. Like Detective Ernie, it's like, these are the two people who have the ability to send them back to jail if they step out of line. Mm -hmm. I can see that building as a threat. I think she's mostly just here just to establish her as a character, but she didn't really otherwise yeah. serve much purpose in the pilot. Right, right. Yeah. Something that would probably be a thing going forward if it had mm -hmm. been picked up. Yeah. I mean, I could see it being interesting about, let's start to explore what are the actual things that parolees have to deal with. Like, I mean, the whole ridiculous rule of you cannot associate with any other parolees. What if you're in the same work program? What if you're in a support group? What if you're in all this right. other stuff? And also, none of their crimes overlapped. It sounds no. like they just met in prison. I think the writing mm -hmm. did do a good job of making it clear that they were all important to each other, that they cared about each other. Like, they have a brief little huddle where they're just like, no one's going to split us up. That was a nice moment. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that the opening credits gave us that little montage of them working in the kitchen together in prison and sharing cells. Yeah, it was very, very efficient in setting up the concept. I'll give that intro that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the era where we don't have an origin story episode. We have the origin story mm -hmm. intro theme. And then the end credits that sum up everything you just watched. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Including, by the way, we filmed that car coming through the wall from every angle. We're going to show you all yeah. the angles. Remember that car like 10 minutes ago? Wow. <laughs> yeah. The only other real character, Kat, what do you think about Vern, the guy with the toupee? He was a character. I like a good toupee <laughs> joke. Everyone loves a solid toupee joke. Yeah, mm. I wonder if they were trying to make him kind of a sympathetic, romantic opposite for Marge, or if we're supposed to find him creepy and slimy. I feel like it could go either way. Yeah, he definitely leaned more toward creepy and slimy for me. Yeah. Of course, sometimes, you know, looking at something that was made <laughs> 30 years ago, things look a little different. Yeah. Maybe but, in the 80s, they just thought he was persistent. Yeah. 
But no, I mean, the whole toupee thing is like, okay, do the joke like once or something, but not every single person has to comment on it. There's other jokes you can make, you know what I mean? But yeah, I could have done without him in the episode altogether, honestly. He wasn't much of a contribution. We have enough story in this episode that we don't need to start bringing in the regular customers yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something I could see the rest of the series fleshing out, who are the people who are regularly coming in and out of this diner. I don't get a sympathetic vibe from him. I think it's more telling, not so much that he has the hots for Marge, but the whole thing of how he's going up to a bookie on parole and asking for tips for the Mm -hmm. horse races, or he's not going to leave a tip. He is a dick. Yeah. Oh, definitely. That's true. And I could see him being someone who gets more involved in crime, who is a threat to them in terms of pulling them back into mm-hmm. that world. Yeah. There are so many things you could do story-wise. Like, through Tony and Roxanne, obviously they have mob ties, and she witnessed a hit of a mm-hmm. mob leader. You could see that coming into their lives again and threatening to pull them in and, and screw things up for them. You could see other people from Cookie's old booking days, you know, maybe ex-clients, stuff like that, who got stiffed on money, who would come back in. With Rally, though, again, we don't really have much of a, what is the kind of broader story that he's right. playing to? Other than the fact he's played by Cleavon Little, he doesn't really have much of a broader thing to explore. Yeah. Yeah. In 1983, especially, I think they wouldn't touch a lot of the things that you would talk about in a show now about Mm -hmm. a black man on parole Mm -hmm. and the things that he would have to deal with. Did y'all see Blind Spotting? No, I haven't. No. It's real good. Is that a recent one? Yeah, it's David Diggs. I forget the name of the guy playing opposite him, but he's on parole and it takes place over the last two days of his parole and him dealing with having a best friend who's still very much trying to pose as a tough guy in Oakland. And he's just trying to Mm. get through the next two days without seeing his best friend do crimes or somehow being accidentally involved in crimes. And there's a little bit of humor to it, but it's also deep, scary stuff. I will have to check that one out. Definitely. It's kind of interestingly ironic that Cleavon Little is probably the most watchable person on Mm -hmm. the show, and yet he has the least interesting backstory. And I'm wondering if, I'm wondering, knowing Joel, I wouldn't be surprised if he intended the script to explore more of the racial angle. Right. Just given that he had no problem doing that in DC Cab and in- In in Car Wash, yeah. Car Wash. But by the time this made it to screen and went through the networks and went through other producers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Got cleaned up a bit. That probably got watered down. Yeah. Not what you're trying for in a pilot, I guess. And again, especially that his entire crime was getting pulled over by a cop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then let's go ahead and bring up Roxanne. Eh, She's very annoying. (laughs) (laughs) She's playing that bimbo stereotype character. Oh, she was just very frustrated. It's like, just go turn yourself in. I know this is a sitcom and we have to have some kind of dilemma that'll get solved in the 20 minutes, but oh, just go turn yourself in already. Yeah, I think her one good line is about the walk-in cooler having a wind chill factor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, refrigerators are cold, Roxanne. <laughs> well spotted. Yeah. It's amusing, again, that it's like this spirals as far out of control as it did. But again, it does so through very stupid choices. Yeah. And it's kind of odd how then Tony gives her the big speech about how sometimes you have to go face the consequences in order to be somebody. Mm -hmm. They're trying this weird thematic thing about how her whole characterization is that she never makes any choices for herself. And yet it's like throughout the thing, we're we're seeing her make a lot of choices. They're just Mm -hmm. really bad ones. Yeah. It's like they're trying to give it a thematic weight that I don't think it fully deserves. (laughs) I I think it would be more of, do we give her to the cops or do we not? Right. She had incredibly shiny pants, though. (laughs) Yeah, her outfit was wonderful. I do also kind of love the thing of how she runs from the crashed car. It's like Detective Ernie's like, but I got her shoes. She can't possibly leave without those shoes. And then like, Tony, why are you heading towards the pantry with a pair of shoes? What did you think about the kind of overall just joke writing? There were some that were pretty okay. There were some solid bits. I think a lot of it was up to delivery. I mean, Mm -hmm. Cleavon Little just has an excellent delivery. That's kind of his whole thing. But there are a few humorous little bits. From a cooking perspective, the moment where they're kind of snipping back and forth about whether or not there's enough eggs for the day, and then he kind of leans quietly over to Tony and says, can you go get some eggs? It's very, (laughs) very accurate and also just a good little bit where most cooks want to stand their ground on things, even when they abruptly realize they're wrong and you just quietly go low-key fix it, so... 
Nobody <laughs> finds out you were ever wrong. Mm. And yeah, you're a breakfast joint. You run out of eggs. That's a serious problem. Yep. They never did get the eggs. They stopped serving breakfast, though. That's true. That's true. There are a few jokes that really landed and were funny, but a lot of it was also, like I said, falling flat, mostly because you've got these two very ditzy characters and then you've got this one kind of uninteresting, not quite straight man. So it's like Cleveland Little's great. Joe Montagna has a couple really good moments, even though he's also got some really bad ones. But overall, eh. It's interesting because... One of my big thoughts as we've been going through this project before revisiting the Batman movies Mm -hmm. is just how bad the humor writing was to my memory in the Batman movies. Uh Uh-huh. But we've seen Joel himself write better comedy. Right. Unfortunately, it's like this episode is falling into a lot of the same traps where it's, okay, I got to make it funny. Let's throw in a light bulb joke. Let's throw Mm -hmm. in a police and you want a donut joke. Yeah. It is falling back on a lot of the typical jokes. Mm -hmm. And those are mostly the ones that fall flat. Yeah. Whereas usually when it tries to get a little sharper with the wit, something that's a little more character driven and something that's a little more biting, those are the bits where it's funnier. Yeah. Well, and it almost makes you wonder, was it a studio thing of like, look, you need to put some more jokes in here because this is a comedy and we want people to get some big laughs. And again, one of the producers of this wrote for the Star Wars Holiday Special, how much input (laughs) did they have? And then even just in terms of the direction, I think a large part of why the opening falls flat is that it feels like it's written more frenetic. Mm-hmm. You know, like you're in the diner, you're moving from table to table, you're calling from across the room and then selling you're next to a person. It feels like it's written to be kind of like following these guys around the room as they're doing their job and crossing paths. But the direction of it is just very flat and too spaced out and there's not enough rhythm to everything. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Not enough going on. Any other thoughts overall on the show? Not really. I think we covered everything. The restaurant should have had a prep area somewhere. (laughs) That's very true. There is no like grill kitchen, just the grill in the back. Yeah. And then there's the giant pantry. Yeah, you need somewhere to actually like get everything ready to put it out on the mm-hmm. line. Like an open kitchen is nice and good. They've got a whole kind of Waffle House thing going where you can see the <laughs> line cook making your stuff. But right. somebody's got to be back there like cracking eggs for scrambles and cutting onions and peppers <laughs> for omelets. Where's that happening? Yeah, are three people enough people to be running this place or should there be a broader cast? Oh, for like 20 covers? Yeah, that's fine. You could do that with three people. I've worked at places that size with three cooks at a time. Mm. You can maybe use a dishwasher. Well, do you think Tony was really a cook, though? Because he seemed like he was primarily a busboy. Yeah, he was the busboy. Rowley was the waiter and Cookie was the cook. Hmm. They could use one more cook then. Because, <laughs> yeah, I didn't really get the sense that Marge was helping out. No, she just seemed to be hanging around, supervising. Maybe she runs the register yeah. or something. Yeah. And then here's the question. Now seeing this pilot, would you have kept watching this show after having seen this pilot had it been picked up? Hmm. I might have given it a few more episodes to find its footing. Yeah, because that's the thing is like pilots a lot of times are really shaky. And sometimes you do need a little bit more once you're past the premise and everything to kind of get going. So yeah, I'd probably give it a little bit more of a chance. It would have to be really strong in those episodes to grab me. And I think it would depend on who the writing staff is that they pull together. Because I don't Mm -hmm. know that Joel would have stuck around beyond the pilot. Probably not. Yeah. Because this was 83, so he'd already done DC Cab and was already gearing up St. Mm-hmm. Elmo's Fire. I mean, we had this interesting period where he did this and he did Codename Foxfire. In both of those are just shows that he created, but otherwise did not have much heavy involvement in. Yeah. So I don't know that like he would have continued as a guiding voice of the show. So then it's just a question right. of, well, now who takes over? Is it going to be Star Wars Holiday Special? <laughs> <laughs> Look, he's got a proven track record. Yeah. Uh, and to be fair, one of the other writers of that holiday special was Bruce Valanche, and he still maintained a good career. Since this never really aired, as far as I can tell, mm-hmm. I can't really tell how it did in the ratings. Can't really tell you what it's up against, but can I just take a few minutes here, just get into what was the 1983 TV landscape in general that this failed no. to sell into? Sure. 1983 was a huge year for long-running shows coming to a close. 
MASH finally ended after 11 seasons. Okay. Little House on the Prairie ended after nine. Laverne mm. and Shirley ended after eight. Chips ended after six. Taxi ended after five. Mm. And the All in the Family continuation, Archie Bunker's Place, ended after four. And if you add that to All in the Family, that was technically 13. Hmm. Debuting this year, the only shows that really did well were Mama's Family, Webster, Hardcastle and McCormick, and Scarecrow and Mrs. King. I said this was the year that MASH was canceled. This was also the debut of the single season after MASH. After MASH. <laughs> where they tried to explore life after MASH. <laughs> now, noticeably, this is a Universal MCA United production, and most of their shows were done for NBC. This was one of the worst years NBC ever had in that every single new show that they debuted in the fall season was canceled after one season. Wow. Oh, wow. And those shows include, I got a whole checklist here, Manimal. Oh, boy. The show about the man who turns into animals. <laughs> Bay City Blues, a Stephen Bochco drama about a minor league baseball team. Mm-hmm. The Yellow Rose, a primetime soap opera about a Texas cattle ranch family, co-starring Sam Elliott and Sybil Shepard. Was Dallas out yet, or was that ahead yes, of its time? Yes, this is okay. just like in the middle of Dallas. <laughs> All right, so I see what they're trying to do there. <laughs> yep, yep. Boone, a drama about a teenager in the 50s who dreams of becoming a rock star. Okay. The Rousters, about a family of bounty hunters descended from Wyatt Earp, co-starring Jim Varney. <laughs> Co-starring Jim Barney? Wow. He was the comic relief uncle. Wow. <laughs> We've got it made, M-A-I-D, about a maid working for two bachelors who constantly fight for her affections. Mm-hmm. Not problematic at all. Mm-hmm. Jennifer slept here about a teenage boy who realizes he's the only person who can see the ghost of the former tenant of their apartment building, who is a 1950s movie star who was run over by an ice cream truck. Okay. Is that a comedy or a drama? It's a sitcom. It's basically like an I Dream a Genie type thing. Mm. <laughs> okay. About a teenage boy and the ghost of an old Hollywood starlet. <laughs> Eight early 80s TV, folks. Wow. Yep. Oh, wait, wait till you get to the last one. And the last one is Mr. Smith about a secret political supervisor for a local Senate election who is a talking orangutan. What? <laughs> what? An orangutan who accidentally drank a formula that was supposed to boost human intelligence and now he can speak and works as a secret political advisor for political campaigns. And it is literally an orangutan wearing glasses and a suit. <laughs> what? Ran for 13 episodes. I need to find wow. this on YouTube. This is ridiculous. So this is the block of shows that Now We're Cooking wasn't fit to be a part of. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's at least three of these I would have canceled in its favor. Right, right. Oh my goodness. I'm looking at just the <laughs> yep. still from, I don't know if this is an episode trailer. It's only 20 seconds. He's like in a suit yep. and glasses. Yep. He looks like out of Planet of the Apes. Yep. And he's wow. the same orangutan who was in Every Which Way But Loose with Clint Eastwood. <laughs> this was like his brief period where he was a star. It was like his Barbarian Brothers era. My goodness. I looked up pictures. It's so good. <laughs> I know. I know. That's a real show. <sighs> so you all think that Now We're Cooking could have done better than any of these shows or at the very least deserved to have its single season? I think it deserved a chance compared to some of that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I would watch this over wow. Hollywood ghost actress or creepy maid show. Yeah, We've Got It Made is probably the one I'm the least interested in. <laughs> I don't know. I want to see The Rousters with Jim Verney. The one about the 50s kid wanting to be a rock star could have been interesting, depending on how they did that. I want to learn a little more about how that one came about, because it, it looks like you're getting yeah. into the very 50s greaser era and trying to get into you know mm -hmm. the rise of the Elvis style rock and very Americana style show. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Bay City Blues about a minor league baseball team. I could see Bochco doing some interesting things with that. Or I don't know how interested I am in the Yellow Rose. No. But it's Sam Elliott on a TV series. That's on worth turning into every week. <laughs> And Manimal. Manimal deserved to exist just so Manimal could have existed. That does sound up your alley, at least. <laughs> I'll yeah. say that. Well, and this was also the TV season that gave us Auto Man, the glowing Tron-style superhero, who again only lasted one season. Oh, okay. So Manimal and Auto Man. Mm -hmm. I think both were created by the same guy. <laughs> So on that note, I think we'll just end this episode by saying, everyone go check out Mr. Smith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kat, any final thoughts on everything? No. Like I said, there wasn't a ton of cooking <laughs> for no. me to talk about. Yeah, unfortunately. 
<laughs> it would be interesting to see a show that, again, kind of explores, you know, the food service industry while also exploring. Again, I would like to see this more as a drama, something that kind of gets more richly into the concept because mm-hmm. it's a good premise. It's a really yes. nice premise for a show. I agree. Yeah. I just think it could have been a lot better done than what they did here. Definitely. Yeah. Well, Kat, thank you so much for joining us on this one. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah, it was a pleasure having you. Yes. And good luck on your upcoming trip again to Antarctica. Yes, thank you. <laughs> By the way, how often do they actually watch the thing down there? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> There's always first years that want to watch it. For a while, the only copy we had in the store was actually the remake prequel. By now, there's a few decent digital copies of the original Carpenter Russell one. It deserves to have a home there. Yeah. (laughs) That gets regular viewings at least like once a season. I think somebody gets together and like, won't this be fun? That and the winter overs tend to like The Shining. Mm. Oh. Might not be the best movie to watch <laughs> when you're going to be stuck in the same place for nine months. <laughs> I think that's going to bring this episode to a close. So good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Hey, everybody. Noel here. I just wanted to put a little update at the end of this episode because I found out a few more things that clarify and correct a few statements that I made during the episode. So I said that Now We're Cooking never actually aired. I was wrong. It did actually air on April 19th, 1983. And despite being a universal production, this did not air on NBC. This aired on CBS. I don't know if that means that it was a universal production that they shopped around from the beginning or if it was intended for NBC, but then when they passed on it, they continued to shop it around. CBS seemed to have a whole mix of different studios producing content for them at the time. In fact, they were the home at the time of Walt Disney, which was the kind of retitled version of The Wonderful World at Disney, where Disney did a lot of anthology programs. And this was before, I think, Disney really latched onto ABC as their central home point. So yes, Now We're Cooking did air. It aired at 8.30 in the evening. I believe that's Eastern Time. It aired against a rerun of Laverne and Shirley, which did 13.6 million in the ratings. And on NBC, a brand new episode of The A-Team was pulling in, yes, I am serious, A-Team was pulling in 22.3 million viewers. This wasn't even a season debut. This was a random middle of season one episode of The A-Team. 22 million viewers. Now we're cooking this lead-in for the evening, playing at 8 o'clock, was Gunshy, a sitcom adaptation of the same novels that the Apple Dumpling Gang were based on. Gunshy was doing so poorly that this was actually the night that it was canceled. So yes, the last episode of one sitcom played against the pilot for another sitcom that never went to series. Looking at the schedule on CBS, it looks like, despite airing in 1983, Now We're Cooking was part of the 1982 season of pilots, because it seemed like CBS, looking at their schedule, they blew through all their main shows, and as they kind of winnowed them down, they needed some filler time, so that's when we got like, yeah, here's five episodes of the Apple Dumpling Gang, yeah, here's five episodes of something else. Shows that were probably already canceled before they even aired. And I'm guessing that the reason why they aired the Now We're Cooking pilot was because they had an open slot and they needed something to fill it with. And for some reason, they didn't just air a rerun of something else. I don't know why. To be fair, I don't mind that. If you have pilots, air them. Let's see them. Even if they never go to series, it'll be interesting. Why not? And I found out that the slot that Now We're Cooking was used to fill was previously filled the week before by Ace Crawford Private Eye, a detective spoof starring Tim Conway as a fumbling, attempted hard-boiled detective. Lasted six episodes. So looking at the broader 1982-1983 season, CBS was still doing really well. They had a really, really solid slate of programming that had been running for years. They had the Jeffersons, One Day at a Time, Alice, Trapper John M.D., Cagney and Lacey, Magnum P.I., Simon and Simon, Knott's Landing, Dukes of Hazzard, Dallas, and Falcon Crest. And as we mentioned earlier, this was the year where MASH and Archie Bunker's Place both came to a close. And also Private Benjamin. I didn't know that there was a TV series based on Private Benjamin and that it lasted more than one season. This season also saw the debut of a couple other shows that did go on to have additional seasons. Goodnight Beantown, which looks like a really interesting comedy starring Bill Bixby, and the long-running Newhart. 
In terms of other shows that only lasted one season during this, we already mentioned Gunshy and Ace Crawford Private Eye. This was the season that gave us Square Pegs, the wonderful teen comedy that not only introduced a lot of us to Sarah Jessica Parker, but was just a really wonderful, sharp, offbeat, wonderful show. One that deserved to go on much longer than it did. Also, we got Gloria, an All in the Family spinoff built entirely around Sally Struthers, because that's what the world needed then. Then there was Bring Em Back Alive, starring Bruce Boxleitner as a big game hunter operating out of Shanghai in the 1930s. Then there was Filthy Rich, a soap-style spoof of soap operas, this time focusing on the big-budget family estate-style primetime soap operas like Dallas and Dynasty. And this one starred Delta Burke, and it actually sounds like something that I would really like to look up. Then, someone thought it was a good idea to make a TV series based on Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, set concurrently in the 1980s, and not make it a musical, but play it sincerely, of seven brothers who kidnap seven women and make them their brides. Starring, you might want to sit down for this, starring Richard Dean Anderson, Peter Horton, and River Phoenix. That is a collection of details I never expected to have. Then, there was another show that I actually quite enjoy and I do recommend, Wizards and Warriors, which was a spoof of fantasy adventure fiction. You know, knights and wizards and princesses and all that type of stuff played kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it's got a kind of very good Princess Bride feel to it. It's one I actually really recommend, starring Jeff Conaway and Julia Duffy. Then there was Tucker's Witch, starring Tim Matheson and Catherine Hicks, about a detective agency run by a married couple where the wife is a psychic. So yeah, someone was like, hey, what if we do Bewitched, but they're detectives? And finally, saving the best for last, we have Small and Fry, about a pair of detectives where one of them, played by Darren McGavin, has the ability to shrink to six inches and uses it to help him solve crimes. While there's definitely a few shows among this lot that I definitely think Now We're Cooking would, would have been a better pick then. I think especially Tucker's Witch, Small and Fry, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. They actually had a nice selection of shows here. That even if you look at the ones that got canceled, they're an interesting slate of shows that I would actually have been curious to see. Like, I really want to see Filthy Rich. I'm curious about Bring Him Back Alive. I'm not interested in Gloria because I never really got into All in the Family. But Wizards and Warriors was a really fun show. Square Pegs is a wonderful cult classic of a show, rightfully so. And again, they didn't really need to sell a new show because they were like primetime gods. Again, Jefferson's, Magnum P.I., Alice, Dukes of Hazard, Dallas, you know, whatever you think of these shows, these were huge shows. And again, they just debuted New Heart, which was another huge show that fits among all those. So I can see why Now We're Cooking got lost in the shuffle. And in fact, when we looked at all the stuff that NBC had put out, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, I think Now We're Cooking really deserved a chance among all of those. Among this slot, I can see why it just got lost in the shuffle and became an also winner. While I still love the concept, I just don't think the quality of it was up there yet where it was really going to hold its own among its brethren. So that's all I had to add. Good night, everybody. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Shumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Shumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.